Welcome to episode 154 of Think Big with Michael Zellner, powered by Sleepy Z's Masonry. My guest today is David Bethel. David is an award-winning author who's written some incredible political and psychological nail biters. His new book, Map in the Night, will be coming out in June. He is originally from Palo Alto, California, and is the son of Paul D. Bethel, who is a foreign service officer and, uh, with the U.S. Department of State. Uh, David graduated from Miami Edison High School in Miami, Florida, and went to Tulane University, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, he was a speechwriter at the Department of Commerce to Cabinet Secretaries in both the George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush administrations. Thanks for joining me today, David. Well, thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would like to thank our two sponsors for Think Big with Michael Zellner. Uh, they are Roof and Nail and Buckley's Grill. Uh, Roof and Nail is one of the leading experts in insurance restorations. Co-owner Kelly Potter and his crews are the preferred vendors of many mainstream insurance companies focus, focused in the tri-state areas of Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Not only can Roof and Nail provide you with an insurance approval quote, but they can also give you a competitive bid uh, for any out-of-pocket roofing projects. Big or small, they do them all. And Buckley's Grill is a hidden gem for those seeking a really fantastic dining experience in the Memphis area. It's locally owned by Jeff Fiorinelli and Ken Dick, and they have specialized in steaks and Southern hospitality here for over 30 years. And anytime you walk in the restaurant, the atmosphere is amazing from when you walk in, greeted at the door, the staff that waits on you, a touch of elegance, the whole place is amazing. And like I said, the food is really amazing. So you're greeted with warm hospitality throughout your whole experience. So I'd like to thank both of them and they make you feel right at home. Um, you know, one thing that uh, really interesting about you, uh, I mentioned you were born in California, but because of your father's position, uh, with the government, uh, you lived all across the world, including in Germany, uh, Japan, and, and Havana, Cuba. What do you remember most about those years as a young kid, that, that David, that still has an effect on you today? Well, uh, the traveling, of course, was constant. I think I figured out at some point that I went to like 10 schools before I ever <laughs> entered eighth grade and came back to the, to the United States. Um, you, when you're when you're that young and growing up, uh, it, you have no relative experience in anything other than living living abroad. And plus, most of my schoolmates were service members' kids and kids of uh, other foreign service officers. So we were all in, in the same boat. What I remember most, I guess, is uh, just being a foreigner in another country, and always having in the back of my mind that I was an American and I was not home and constantly wanting to come home. Now, we did have breaks, uh, home visits, where we would come back home for oh, a month, six weeks sometimes at a time. Um, and during those periods of time, of course, we missed a lot of school. And that's actually what got me interested in writing was because I was reading all the time. My parents forced me to read because I was missing so much school. And I just, uh, you know, I became a voracious reader and decided one day, gee, maybe I'd like to try this myself. And, and that's, that's where I am today. Awesome. Um, why did you end up deciding to go to Tulane in New Orleans where you obviously you worked your butt off because you graduated college Phi Beta Kappa. My sister did too. So I know what oh. that entails. Uh, you know, Phi Beta Kappa is the oldest academic, you know, society, and it's also the most prestigious honor society too. What, what led you to Tulane? Well, originally it was, I was going to play football there. Um, I had been contacted by some folks from Tulane. Now they didn't offer me a scholarship, but they wanted me to walk on. Um, I had some success in high school. So uh, that combined with the fact that it was such a, a highly touted ac academic uh, college, uh, the, the, the number one on my list <laughs> that I had, that I, that I applied to. So those two, and those two were were the most influential. Now, a lot of people always say, "Well, what about going to you know New Orleans?" My God, yeah, I right. Know, I didn't know anything about New Orleans, right? yeah. nothing. I mean, maybe that sounds naive, but and and I sh probably should have found out a little bit more once I was accepted there. But the, New Orleans was a surprise to me when when I got there. It was, and it's really 
probably very unlike what it is today. It was a real Southern town back then, um, right. very Southern, much more than I was used to coming from a, uh, not a sophisticated city, but probably a little more cosmopolitan in, in Miami. Uh, so that that was a bit of a, of a culture shock. But New Orleans was a great city, the Garden District and everything else. Probably that's another thing that might have had a, a, a uh, an influence on my decision to become a writer, because you could walk through these fantastic old parts of the city with these mansions and the moss hanging down and everything that you hear about in Anne Rice's vampire vampire uh, books is, is there. So it, that, that might have had, a, had an influence as well. You know, one of my lifelong friends went to Tulane. He graduated in, in the late 80s and uh, he had to, all right, say, OK, I'm just going to pretend that Bourbon Street is not there. Right. Because if exactly. I want to if I want to be successful and go to law school like he did, and, you know, he made it and he ended up getting a job. He's been with the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of California for 20 years. And in his 50s, just got a job with the uh, um, U.S. Department of Justice. And he's get, oh, getting, ready, getting ready to go overseas for a couple of years. So, yeah. But Tulane is where it all started. But he had to block out Bourbon Street because he said, yeah, that's just not what I want, I'm going to do if I want to get into law school and move forward. You got to stay away from there. Yeah, a lot of kids lose their balance, especially coming there at 18 and being able to drink. A lot of kids, you know, they they have not had any, much to drink going there and, and going there and being able to walk up and down Bourbon Street and walk in any bar you want to and have a drink is, again, is a bit of a bit of a culture shock. And a lot of kids, uh, young people uh, just lose their balance. I think they say that at least one out of every three students at Tulane, and maybe this is this is nationally, I don't know, but never make it to their second year. Oh, wow. I never knew that. And I could yeah. see that. I could see that down there, though, that easily to lose your balance. Yes. You know, at the young age of just, you know, around 25, you, you began your career in politics and working with the government. It was 1972. You became a staff member of the Legacy of Parks program in the executive office of the president. And that program has been called, quote, the most uh, significant environmental program of the 20th century, unquote. Tell us a little bit about that program and, and why you chose, you know, to get into that field, please. Well, it, getting into that program was purely accidental uh, or happenstance, to put it that way. Um, I had sent a resume or my father had given a resume to Senator Dodd from Connecticut um, and he was leaving his office let me see if I can remember this right. It fell on the floor and Senator Buckley, who was just coming into the Senate, picked it up and just happened to lay it on his desk. Now, he was having a meeting with the head of this program that you just mentioned, the Legacy of Parks program, Daryl Trent, that day to discuss the program. And Daryl walked in, sat down, was waiting for the senator, just happened to pick up my resume and looked at it, recognized my father's name. So he asked Senator Buckley, he said, would you mind if I called this young man? We have we have openings here on the staff. They were just building their staff. And that's how that's how that happened. But it was a, it was a great education and it was a wonderful, wonderful program. Plus, it gave me as an entry level uh, person on the staff there, uh, opportunities that I wouldn't ha have had had I gone into an organization that was that was fully formed. I was able to do advance work for the uh, for the people that spoke on behalf of the program. I traveled all over doing that. And I had no idea what I was doing, really. It was just learned by the seat of your pants. And they didn't have anybody to write there. So I started writing speeches for, for among other people, Julie Nixon Eisenhower and, and her sister, Tricia, who were surrogates for the president on the on the on the when they w ran around giving giving away land to state and local governments, unused federal land to state and lo uh, local governments. So it was a trial by fu by fire, but it was a great education. You know, I, I talk about a lot, the power of a moment and that one little moment with your resume falling on the floor and yeah. him picking it up. I mean, what a difference that made in your life. Well, it, it changed my life completely. I yeah. mean, you know, there are times when I wonder well, what the hell would I have done had that not happened? But you can't think like that. It was going to, it happened and you yeah. have to take advantage of it. It was absolutely supposed to happen that way. Yeah. You know, as a kid in the 80s, uh, you know, then President Ronald Reagan was one of my heroes. Uh, you know, you helped design the speech uh, for former Senator Paul Axall of Nevada, who you served as a speechwriter and press secretary for. And then 
uh, nominate then Governor Reagan, who was the nominate for uh, nominate for California governor uh, for president in 1976. Um, yeah. You also wrote the main article uh, for the publication that celebrated his second inauguration, which was called, quote, We the People in American Celebration, um, which I believe probably was 19, about 1985 or so. 84. 84, 85. OK. How did you get those incredible opportunities? Well, again, uh, sometimes these things just happen. <laughs> I um, <clears throat> I got a job with Senator Paul Laxalt. He was a first-term senator. Some Again, uh, someone at the RNC, the Republican National Committee, he was building his staff, gave it to his administrative assistant, and he saw it and he called me up and said, do you want to interview for the job of press secretary? I was working on the House side at the time. I said, sure, why not? So I went over there, got hired. Now, about a eight or nine months into his first year, the senator uh, announced that he was going to serve as the campaign chairman for Ronald Reagan, who was going to seek the presidency. That's when he ran against against Ford back in 76. Of course, we were all stunned. We had no idea that this was going to happen, especially to a first term senator nine months into his job announces that he's going to take, take this on. Um, and that's how I got involved with, with the Reagan administration through Senator Laxalt, met a lot of wonderful, wonderful, good people, actually, uh, including Reagan, who was a very nice man, had dinner with him a couple of times, met him at the White House, plus at the, in the senator's office, uh, just, just a, a, a really, a, a, besides everything else, he was just a nice guy. So you had a chance to spend some time with him then. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, that. Like I said, I look back at those times in my life, and um, I was too young to vote for him. Um, but just watching him on, on TV, you know, Ronald Reagan just had a presence about him that just, you know, you just listened. Well, he was he was uh, he was natural. He was he, he was not he was not at all uh, big headed or or or, or that he. He was very much a man of the people, and it's it's very unfortunate we see that. And I don't want to get into the politics of today. Sure. When when you see what's going on today, and and I had the opportunity to work for a, for a great man like him, and like like Paul Laxalt, who was also a wonderful human being. Both both were governors. That's how they got together in the first place. Laxalt was governor of Nevada when Reagan was governor of California, and they, if I remember correctly, they 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 did a water compact between the two states. In any event, they became very close. Long story short, these are these are gentlemen. These are guys, along with a lot of other people back at the time, Barry Goldwater, John Rhodes on the House side. Uh, that uh, John, Jay Garn was a senator from Utah. Uh, Lloyd Weicker from Connecticut. I'm, I'm just mentioning names of, of people that that I worked with or what, staffs that I worked for. Even even John F. Even um, Edward Kennedy. I mean, back then they worked across the aisle with each yes, other. Yes, they did. And and the essence of representative democracy is compromise. And these these guys sat down and they hashed things out. It wasn't do or die, or if you do, if you, if I don't get everything I want, I'm going to say nasty things about you. There was none of that. Everything was done for the for the common good. Something that I just don't see happening today. No, and I think it's you know with the the rise of social media, it's just going to continue to get worse and worse. It's a, it's very unfortunate. I, you know, Joe, Joe Lieberman, as you know, just passed away yeah, recently. Wonderful guy, just a wonderful. And I I posted on there because I try to do the same thing. I try to stay away from you know today's politics on there. But I put he was a man that everybody loved. He could work with people, and one of his biggest things is he could cross the aisle and work with both sides. And you just don't find that today. It's oh, unfortunate. I often think Things would be a lot different had McCain chosen Lieberman as his vice president uh, and run the, with the McCain-Lieberman ticket. Uh, no matter what you think about who's running against who, those two men were, were, were good men. And I think that our history would have been a lot dif different had McCain selected Lieberman. I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, I mentioned when we started that you were a speechwriter, as we talked about in, in the 90s and 2000s, the cabinet secretaries at the Department of uh, Commerce of Education for both President Bush's administrations. How much pressure were you under writing speeches for some of the top political people, not only in our country, but in the entire world? Again, it's all relative. When you're working in a, in a, in a world like that, having come from the Capitol Hill and having worked on the House side and on the Senate side, there's always a lot of pressure to get things get things done. And um, 
Yes, there was there was a lot of there was pressure. I mean, you know, at the last minute, someone wants to change the speech. You're riding in an airplane someplace, and the guy says, "You know, I don't like this. I've decided I don't like this speech." So we gotta we gotta go with something some of the, something else. One thing I do recall speaking of that uh, after September 11th, if I remember correctly, was on a Tuesday, and there was a speech on a Thursday that the the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Don Evans, who I work for, had to give. Well, we had to change everything. I mean, no longer was it business as usual. Everything had to change. So we had to sit down and write just a whole battery of speeches for him because he was going across the country. Originally, he was going to give speeches on policy issues. But again, that changes w- with, the, with the events. The event changed, so he was now speaking on set on, on September 11th and representing the uh, president, uh, President Bush, on on where where we were going to go for there from there, and actually we didn't really know where we were going to go from there because the, right. the event had only happened a couple of days before. But that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of atmosphere that you live in, and you you don't get too terribly excited about it. You you've dealt with it all along, so you just deal with it. And you obviously dealt with it well because you did it for both Bushes, so they obviously liked you. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a good time. I enjoyed it and and it, it, it it's a time in my life that I'll never forget. That's great. You know, um what inspired you to eventually transition from, you know, career in politics and the government to becoming uh, a writer of psychological and political thrillers? Uh well, I'm a writer. That's what I do. Um and I'd always wanted to write fiction. Um I, I dealt enough with real life stuff, so maybe I just want mentally. I just wanted to get away from that and get into get into you know making stuff up. Um, and I decided, well, I mean, what else am I going to do with my life? This is what I've been doing right up to this point. So that's that's what got me into it. And I I had a feeling that I could that I could do it. I mean, it, transitioning from speech writing and and writing of white papers and so on and so forth is is just night and day from from writing a novel but i think if you can write and if you have the discipline if you have the imagination you can do it so i just decided what the hell i'll give it a shot and here i am (laughs) right you know we're going to talk about some of your incredible books um how did uh the real life events surrounding blue moon influence your approach to writing fiction based on true crime and tell us just a little bit about the book please uh, Blood Moon came about. I mean, Blood Moon. I'm sorry. That, that's okay. Sorry. Blood Moon came about. I got a call one day from a, a man who had read some of my other novels and said he wanted to sit down and talk to me about a, a case that he was handling. Um, at the time, I didn't know he was a private eye. I originally thought he was an attorney. So we went, my wife and I went and we met with him. And it turns out he was an old high school. Uh, he went to the same high school I did. I didn't even know this. He graduated a couple of years ahead of me, but he he knew my name when he and when he read my books, he said, oh, yeah, that's the same guy that went to, that I went to high school or that went to the high school a couple of years after me. Long story short, he told me this. He, he relayed this story to me that was so hard to believe. His client was kidnapped. Um, he was a he was a very successful entrepreneur in Miami. Owned restaurants and and uh, was a uh, was an accountant to to big companies and also ran some Medicaid services down there. He was just he was a jack of all trades. Made made good money for himself. He was also an immigrant from Argentina who didn't speak English the first I don't know ten years of his life. But that's another story. Anyway, so this group of people they kidnap him. They take him out to a warehouse uh, in in the rural area of Miami. This is before what we're doing now. This kind of stuff and 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 you know uh, iPhones and all the rest of it. They kept him for thirty days. They they extorted all of his money by making him sign checks and even signed over the deed of his house. The whole time he was there. His head was wrapped in masking tape. Now he's in a warehouse that's over a hundred degrees inside the warehouse. This is during summer. Um, they're feeding him very little, giving him very little water to to, to weaken his his you know his resolve not to do what they want him to do. Um, his face starts to melt because of the of the of the, of the masking tape. Um, so he at the end of thirty days, they've pretty much you know wrung all the money out of him. 
Um, they take him to uh, out in the Everglades somewhere and they run his car into a telephone pole with him in it, obviously. And they have propane canisters in the back of the car. So <clears throat> a car blows up. Now they had, they had pumped him full of, of, of uh, horse tranquilizers and, and alcohol. <laughs> And when he he didn't know he, he doesn't remember any of this, and a lot of this was reconstructed for him later on. But apparently, he fell out of the car. They didn't put a seatbelt on. Uh-huh. So as they're driving away, one of them notices that he got up. His name is Mark Schiller, by the way. So Mark gets up, and he again he's out of it, and the car turns around, and runs him over again. But they and when they run him over, they run him over in a way that he's between the wheels. So he survives that. Um, They have cars on fire. People are starting to notice what's going on. Fire engines are coming, so they leave. Now, they take Mark to the hospital. But being a foreigner and being from South America, the police can't believe the story when he tells them the story. Actually, he calls his lawyer. His lawyer tells him the story. They don't believe it. They think he's part of this cocaine cowboy thing, which was really running rampant in Miami at the time. So they dismiss it. They're saying, ah, he's, you know, some, he's some uh, drug dealer and, and he's been uh, he, his own, his own gang or another, another group of people, cartel want to get rid of him. And that's what happened. Well, Mark's lawyer calls my guy, the guy that's telling me the story and says, you got to come talk to him. This is, you know, we've got to do something for him. So, Ed Du Bois, the name of the private investigator, goes to talk to him, and he says, "I had I really couldn't believe the story myself initially, um, but I did a little investigating on my own, and it you know it he's it was clear he was not he was not involved in drugs that he was a decent businessman, honest as the day is long. He had he, everybody said he was a, he was a good person, so Ed got involved in it, and he said, but, but I took it to the police again." And I'd worked with them before, and they didn't believe me. He's, in the meantime, again, this is all a true story. It's so hard to believe. Oh, in the meantime, Ed gets a call from from somebody, uh, an accountant who's a, who's a friend of his. And the accountant had done some work for some of these guys that were, that were involved in, in this whole thing. In the meantime, the... The, the, the man who was who was kidnapped remembers, starts to remember uh, the voice sounding like someone he knew. And he identified the guy as his business partner. Well, when Ed called the, the accountant back, that's the one that, that they were talking about. The, 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 business, the business partner worked with this accountant. So Ed says, do me a favor, call him up, get him into your office. I want to talk to him. Call him on bi- your business. Don't tell him what that, you, that I'm going to be there. You call him on your business. So Ed goes in the, that day, meets with the guy, and, and Ed says, what the hell? I have nothing to lose. He says, I know what you did. I know you kidnapped. You're, you're responsible for kidnapping your business partner. So the guy stumbles through a vague conversation, and he says, just give me a couple of days and I'll, I'll get back to you. So a couple of days go by, the guy gets back to him with a piece of paper and he says, we will give some of the money back to Mark if he will sign this piece of paper that he'll never tell anybody that any of this happened. So Ed is thinking, what a moron. First of all, he wants me to sign a piece of paper that I can take with me. And he really thinks that if he signs this piece of paper, everything's going to go away. Right. So he's, so Ed says, Ed signs it. And and the guy says, okay, now let me, the guy doesn't sign it, and maybe maybe he wasn't that stupid, or maybe he the the idea that he would even do this is pretty stupid. He says, I'm going to take it back to my business partners. We'll get back to you. In the meantime, they start to run through all this money. They're even living in Mark's house because I told them they signed the deed. Right. So they're living in his house. They signed over all this. They start to run out of money because they're they're idiots and they they don't know how to how to handle money. So they kidnap two other people. The problem is they kill these people in, in during the during the you know the the, the 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 event of the kidnapping. They end up killing them, a man and his girlfriend. Um, a man who, by the way, started the one eight hundred sex line, uh, you know that whole business and made a fortune. That's how they found him to, to kidnap him. They take their bodies out to the warehouse where Mark was kidnapped and held. They chop up the bodies. And they stick them in some 40-gallon 
can, those big barrels. They take it out to the Everglades and they throw the barrels in the Everglades. But on the way back, one of the Everglade patrol people sees them, wonders what the hell they're doing out there because they're driving around in fancy cars. And he said, what, they, what are they doing out there in those fancy cars? So they go and they find the barrels. And one of the cops who is now in charge of that case remembers Ed Kemp coming in and saying and telling him this story. So he identifies who the people in the barrels are and starts to put two and two together from that and gets hold of Ed and says, look, I think we're on to something. Long story short, they find these guys through Ed and through Mark, uh, giving them the information that they had, and they bring they bring them bring them to justice. Now, Ed tells me this story. He wants me to help him write a true crime book because he is serving as the consultant on a movie called Pain and Gain. I don't know if you ever heard of it, which is a, a dark, they're making this whole incident into a dark comedy. And of course, Ed is just, he's, he's flummoxed. He's really not happy with that. Mark is not happy about it at all, that they would try and make a, a dark comedy out of something so awful. He wants, he and Mark want me to write this book to, to bring the truth to bear. Problem is the movie is coming out in six months. So there's no way we can do it. But the story intrigued me so much, I asked them if they would mind if I wrote a novel based on this story. And that is the story of, of Blood Moon. Wow. What? Yeah, That's just, crazy. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, I apologize for saying Blue Moon. Obviously, I was thinking of beer. I'm <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's quite all right. I say it too myself. <laughs> Can can you discuss uh, the challenges you faced in uh, developing the characters of the antagonists in your novels, considering you know their dark and disturbing nature sometimes? Sure, uh, it, it it is it is uh, a little dark uh, getting into all that. What I, and and this goes back to Ed again and the whole Blood Moon thing. What, when he's ha handed me all the files for for this case and I read through them, I found one where he had served as a, uh, a, uh, got a, a consultant on the case of this Key West serial killer. So I asked him, I said, I'm kind of interested in what this is all about. So I took it from him and I started to read through it. And that got me interested in this whole genre of, of serial killers and, and what the way, you know, and, and that whole dark alley, um, it intrigued me for some reason. Um, so I started reading about it. I read quite a bit um, about it. I probably probably have a BA in, in aberrant psychology at this point, but, um, aberrant psychology. Um, and I started reading, the FBI has a lot of information on it. So I kind of got all that together. And when I came across a, a story, a real life story of, of, of a serial killer who was, who was working out of Louisiana, um, and I decided I wanted to write a, a, a story about this, which is which ended up being called the book called Wretched, um, and that's basically how how I do it. I I don't write true crime books because, as good as they are, and as intriguing as they are, and as many as I had to read to get information on serial killers, the why always intrigued me. That they don't get really into the why. Why do these guys do things like this? So I decided if I'm writing my books, my, my psychological thrillers, I could try and get into their heads and decide the why of it. So that's why I got into writing, you know, to writing my novels. Very interesting. You know, in what ways did you draw from your personal experiences in politics uh, to create compelling narratives in your political thrillers, you know, like Evil Town? Um, quite a bit, I would say. Naturally, I, I didn't have all the drama that are in these, these books, thank God. Um, but in order to make them real, in order for the, the reader to get into it and really believe they're, they're somewhere in Washington when they're reading this, I had to mine a lot of my experiences and you know you have to know how how these how the Senate works, how the House works, and that sort of thing. Just the just the technical aspect of politics, aside from the the personal aspects, the technical aspects of how things run, um, how these guys meet, how do they decide on on you know what compromises they're going to be willing to live with, and all that sort of thing. So that's the answer is yes. I drew on it uh, to 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 a, to a great degree. 
You know, well-known uh, political pundit uh, Roger Stone said this of Evil Town, quote, I have been involved in politics for 40 plus years, so I understand politics. Yet to date, I have not read a novel about Washington or politicians that captured the true nature of the city, its players, or what goes on with real, any real understanding or believability until I read Evil Town, unquote. You know, consider, you know, his long career in Washington and, you know, everything he's done in politics. That says a lot coming, you know, from him, considering what he's gone through and the people he's gone through it with in D.C., yeah, right. It, it, Roger, oh, I don't really know what's happened to Roger, but when we were starting out together, we did start out together in the Nixon White House in 72, both as young men, and, and I became friendly with him. Um, and he's kind of kept up with my career. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm glad he likes, as I said, I don't, I don't understand Roger these days, but I'm glad he liked my book. <laughs> right, right. What impact do you uh, hope your novels have on readers, you know, especially in terms of you know, portraying themes of courage, justice, and human resilience? I think sometimes um, we become so self-centered or so focused on where we are in life with, with good reason. We have families, we have jobs, we have to maintain and that. But we sometimes forget that there's a really a larger world out there, uh, a lot going on. Um, and sometimes we need to be reminded that uh, you need to get beyond yourself, beyond your beyond your family, if you will, uh, to really understand what's going on in your own life. And I think perhaps that that might that might define it for you. Okay. How do you balance uh, the line between you know fiction and reality when incorporating actual events in, into your storytelling? All my novels are based on an experience, uh, uh, not my own experience, but an experience. All of them come from, from real life. For example, the, the, the novel that I'm currently, uh, that, that, that's about to come out in June, Mapping, Mapping the Night. I, got, I read a story in the New York Times about uh, police going to, going to a house discovering a body and seeing the son of the woman who was lying on the bed with, with an ice pack, putting it, actually ice cubes, putting it on her head. He, he couldn't understand why she wasn't waking up and he thought she was sick. And he, rem he told the police, whenever I was sick, she would go to the uh, refrigerator, get ice and put it on my head. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to revive her. Well, that kind of haunted me. Um, the, the picture of that little boy there with his mother, who's just been raped and killed, um, trying to trying to revive her. And there are other things about that particular event that struck me. The police said that when they went in the house, it was immaculate. Uh, it's like it had been cleaned with a fine tooth comb, not just by a perpetrator who was trying to get rid of the evidence, any evidence that he was there, but you know, it was just way too clean. And and. Moving down the road, um, there were a number of other uh, women that the same person raped, raped and killed, and their apartments, all their houses, their apartments all looked the same. So these were elements that interested me and that I then built a story around. That's how I build my stories. I build my stories around a true event and, and then let my imagination go from there. I don't work from an outline. I don't do you know, backstories on the characters or any of that. I, I know a lot of successful writers do that. It just doesn't work for me. I, I write the way I read. I want to be surprised at what's coming around the corner. Could you share insights uh, into your research, you know, process, you know, as you're just talking about the process for writing novels like Blood Moon and Evil Town, particularly, you know, when it comes to dealing with, you know, sensitive and complex subject matters like they are? Um, a lot of research does go into most of my novels. I've, I've just mentioned, I've just mentioned, you know, an instance, the Mapping the Night, where, where sure. I got that and I had to go back into uh, the archives of the newspaper I f first found in the New York Times and find all the other articles that related to this particular event. Then once I have an idea, uh, what I call um, my, my little kernel of, of knowledge about the story, I will then decide, okay, well, what kind of person could possibly do this? And then I will then 
again, go back to the information that I've been able to call over the years about these, these people and the way they operate, read through that, and then incorporate that into the novel and into the characters. That, of course, then leads to you have to have protagonists to deal with the antagonists. And then I have to build the characters of the people uh, that are that are operating on the other side of the law. One of the good things about writing crime is that you're dealing with two extreme parts of human nature, those who violate human nature and those who put their lives at line on the line trying to get things back into balance. So that's you know that's that's one of the good things I enjoy about writing about uh, writing true crime. I mean writing about crime is that you you get to deal with all these emotions and all of these extreme extreme acts of uh, well I wouldn't say violence but just extreme acts. When you've done obviously done a lot of research on serial killers and you know what makes them I guess the word I'll just use the word tick. Um, what are some of the things that you found that really you know, it's different from them because, you know, there's so many people today. I unfortunately years ago dated someone who I thought was, I found out a year and a half in, I thought was just a sociopath, but ended up being a psychopath. And I'm lucky I got out of the relationship when I did, or it would have been bad, very bad. Um, but some of them just seem so normal. You would just never know because they're charming. You know, that's what yep. the sociopath is like, very charming people that come across that way. And if you're dealing with them in short spurts, they're usually fine. It's the people, you know, that when you spend a long time with them, it's different. But what what have you found that makes them, you know, tick and, and act the way they do? Yeah. Well, John Douglas, uh, a profiler with the FBI, one that actually started the whole profiling movement, once said, if you think you're going to figure out a way to understand these people and you think you understand them, you belong in a hospital. That being, you're never really going to understand them. However, they have developed certain ways of trying to understand why they act the way they do. Um, Bundy, for instance, you just mentioned, was he was a totally good-looking young man, came from a a decent middle-class family, actually went to law school, worked on a suicide hotline in Seattle. You'd never know that this guy would turn out to be the way he, way he did. But apparently, he had a uh, severe uh, problem with his own uh, self-awareness, his own he – was, he was not as confident as he, he looked. If he was put in a position where he was challenged – or his self-confidence went downhill. That's when something snapped that, you know, you can't identify it. What is it? Something would snap and he would go on these binges. He once said that it was all about power and control. If he thought he had lost control of a situation or a person, that's when something bad would happen. Now, clearly, that is not something that you're going to find in the quote normal human being there's something different about these people ed kemper the co-ed killer out in san, san san diego maybe i think it was anyway he was another one brilliant guy he had a brilliant iq um he said it was because his mother was such a pain in the to pain in the neck to him over the years. He just ended up hating all, all women. Once again, you have to take that with a grain of salt because before he ever killed any of these women, he killed his grandparents when he was a teenager and he was then put in an institution. They thought they had you know, gotten the bad out of him and he went back to doing what he did. Berkowitz said it was a dog. Uh, the, the, the strangler out in Los Angeles says it was because of Satan. Long, long way. That's a long way of explaining that a lot of these, a lot of these guys just have a, they just have a screw loose, and or most of them have come from very bad backgrounds where they're sexually or or mentally and psychologically abused. I figured that was probably going to be a lot about it. Yeah, you said, "quote Keith Richards, the mumbling singer songwriter guitarist with the Rolling Stones, who along with Mick Jagger has written some of the most memorable music in rock and roll history, once said he begins with a riff or refrain and builds his songs around a simple riff. Anyone who has ever heard, I can't get no satisfaction, unquote, no doubt understands what he means. And that's how I write. 
Um, where, how did you come up with like that there that, that you took it from the song and everything like that and you figured out that it was the same thing that you did? I, w- I heard an interview with Keith Richards somewhere um, and I was in the middle of a book at the time. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, that's that I conflated one with the other. But seriously, it, it, because of the way I write, as I've explained, I take a kernel of, of something, whether it's a kernel of a story or a kernel of a, of a, of a, of a true crime um, in, incident or whatever, or a personality, and I just put that down on a piece of paper. Getting back to mapping the night. I didn't know where I wanted to go with the novel, but I know I wanted the scene in there about the boy with the with the ice. So I started with that. I started with the scene of the police walking into the room, finding the boy with his mother, leaving the room, looking around and, and noticing how, how clean the place was. And that's what I started. That was my first chapter. That was the introduction to the novel. I had no idea where I was going to go from there, but that was my riff. That refrain was going to play throughout the rest of the novel. Wow. You know, what motivates you, uh, David, to continue exploring different genres and themes in your writing, such as, you know, transitioning from political thrillers to, you know, historical mysteries like Little Wars? I don't know. I never know where I'm going to go next. I have no plan. Uh, I know that sounds hard to believe that you could sit down in front of a computer, which in, in front of which you're going to spend the next six months of your life, four or five hours a day. But I really don't. I, I just, I wish I could answer that question. I don't know why I go from one to the other. I just know I have a story in my head. That story has to be played out because it's bugging the hell out of me. And I start from there and I go from there. I can't tell you where I'm going to go, where I'm going to go next. One day, one morning, I'll wake up and I'll turn to my wife, who I always talk to about this. I got an idea for a story and I'll try it out on her. And she, she, a lot of them, she says, Dave, that's ridiculous. Others, she says, yeah, yeah, I have something there. I will take that and I'll sit in front of the computer and off I go for the next six months. Wow. (laughs) You know, you talked about Mark Schiller and Ed Dubois. How did you did you approach collaborating with them when incorporating their experiences into the fictional characters? You know, because just like you said, you 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 you're real careful on things like that, and and you and you're writing fiction, you right. know, and, and and they wanted that story to come out, and so. But how did when you spent time with them and and and, and talked over all the stuff, and you already obviously had the story and everything, but you had to get a lot more information from them too, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I had a a box, a moving box, full of files that 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 uh, Ed had on the on the case. I also got court records from the case, uh, which were boxes. Um, and fortunately, one of the things that Ed did when he started working with Mark, as soon as he started to see that Mark had something here, he says, I want you to write down everything, everything that you can remember from the minute you were taken until, you know, you were, until now, until you're talking to me. So he wrote a journal, basically, a, a couple hundred page journal where he documented everything. And from all of that material, then from sitting down and talking to Mark and talking to, uh, to Ed, I put it all together and there you have it. What advice would you give aspiring writers looking you know, to delve into the realm of psychological thrillers or, or political fiction, you know, based on real events? Well, first of all, you have to, you have to ask if you really want to be a writer. <laughs> right. uh, that's, it, it's a tough go. Um, I think I read somewhere that less than 1% of people who want to be writers ever end up making a living as a writer. I was very fortunate in that I found something. I found politics. I found it, it, it all starts back when I was in Washington. I was working as an intern one summer. And it, it occurred to me after being there for a few weeks that these people need speeches written. They need press releases written. They need testimony. House, you know, when they go on the, on the floor of the Senate, they need, they need a script for that. So I found my niche as a writer. But it's very, very hard for someone to make a living as a writer. But, okay, let's say that they're determined to do it. They have to have a few a few qualities that are important. First of all, you have to have the discipline to sit down 
and just write plenty of, everybody says i got a novel in me and i can no, you, you know you really don't not unless you sit down and write it you don't have a novel in you as i said i sit in front of a computer five four or five hours a day or six months you know, writing doing nothing but that um you have to be able to do that secondly you have to be able to accept criticism uh, rejection. I mean, I have enough rejection notices to paper my house. Uh, if if you're going to let that bother you, you're not in the in the right business. You have to be also in in that vein. You have to be able to take criticism when you when you present something to somebody. There there are going to be a t- times when they say, you know, this just doesn't work. You got to you got to change this. You got to change that. If you're if you can't handle that kind of criticism, you can't be a can't be a writer. Um, if you're looking to for success in the sense that you're looking to be on the New York Times bestsellers list and that's what's motivating you to write, you're in the wrong business. You, you write because you enjoy writing and that's basically, you know, that's basically where you got to go with that. Did those rejections that you got motivate you even more? Yeah, yeah, they did. It, I mean, it was disheartening when you first, when you know, when you're just starting out. And you're getting these rejection letters. It, it, it is disheartening, but you just got to put it behind you. You know, I'm a writer. I write. That's what I do. If you don't think it's, you know, if it's good, not good enough for you, I'll move on to the next guy. You said, quote, one of my dad's jobs as press attache for the embassy was to escort visiting dignitaries. And I got to have a long conversation with Jackie Robinson in the dugout. I could have died and gone to heaven right there. I wanted to talk to him about baseball. And all he wanted to talk to me about was my life in Japan and the Japanese people and culture, unquote. You know, that's both awesome and it's sort of a little funny at the same time. That had to be beyond an amazing day for you. Oh, it was amazing. He was my hero. Um, I, I, my parents, my, my parents, my, my, excuse me, my mother's parents lived in Brooklyn. Said so This is back in the uh, 50s when the Brooklyn Dodgers were everything to the people of Brooklyn. I mean, they lived and died with the bums, them bums from, from, uh, from Brooklyn. My grandfather instilled in me a love for the, for the Dodgers. And whenever I came home to spend time with them, we always went every day and we went to a, to a ball game. And uh, Jackie Robinson was, he and Duke Snyder were my heroes on the, on the, on the Brooklyn team. What happened was the, the Dodgers came to Japan. We were living in Japan. It was after they won the World Series in 55. I was like eight years old or something. And my dad knew Walter O'Malley, who was the owner of the Dodgers. So he invited the family to have lunch with, uh, excuse me, breakfast with him at the hotel they were staying in. So we went there and it turned out it was a breakfast with the entire team. We were sitting at a table, a long table uh, in, in the in the dining room with all of these people who I I I, I can't tell you, I, I I what an experience what an experience that was. And then to be able to go to a ball game later on in the week and sit in the dugout with them and talk to Jackie Robinson, well, as I said, I could have died and gone to heaven, and that would have been my life. <laughs> that had to be just like that's so cool. Yeah, it was. Tell us a little bit more, you know, about your dad and influence that you know he had on your life and career, and, and also about your mom, your wife Carol, and your family. Well, as we as we've discussed, my dad was in the foreign service, so we spent a lot of time moving moving around different places. Um, and being a press attaché, he had all of these people that would come into town, and he would have to. Uh, squire them around. Um, among them was uh, Errol Flynn, who, you know, the, the, the uh, Robin Hood, the actor who we met, quite a character he was. Uh, Hemingway was another one that we met. He, he, he's frequent a, a bar in Havana where my dad frequented all the time. So, so we, we, we had an opportunity to meet him. Um, met Fidel Castro. My dad was putting on a press conference for Castro, the first international press conference he had after he came into power. And um, he was holding Castro down in a hotel room. Uh, the, the press conference was on the top of the hotel. Castro was in a hotel room somewhere in the hotel. He took me down to to bring Castro back up. And of course, you know, all of us living in Cuba at the time, Castro was, whoa, that was a, that was a big damn deal. Right. Walked into the room and um, of course, every kid my age knew who he was, who his brother was, who Che Guevara was, and all this, 
all the others. There was a man named Camilo Cienfuegos, who was the basically the general, the the military mind behind Castro. So all those guys were there. So we walked into this room again, another one of those breathtaking moments. Um, Castro stood up to talk to my dad about, you know, my dad was giving him the lowdown. This is, this is where you're going to go and this is what you're going to do. These are the questions. Where This is where you're going to sit, so on and so forth. And, I, and I'm standing there looking at his gun. He has a sidearm. And as I said, I'm a young kid, so my, my eye level is right at his right at his sidearm. And he notices me looking at his gun. So he says, my dad, he says, if I unload my gun and take the get the bullet out of the clip here, can can I give it to your son? He's admiring my gun. So he does that. He gives me the gun. I mean, you know, what, what other experience can a, can a kid have? So it was, it, that's, that's more or less the, the, the picture of my dad had that I have of my dad always leading from one of these wonderful events to the other. And of course my mother, she, uh, you know, it wasn't until later till I realized all the packing and the moving and the keeping the kids. Because she had to squ- drag us around, you know, my, myself and my sister, two squealing little kids to every one of these different towns and, and places that we lived. Because sometimes we lived in three cities in one country. We lived in three cities in five years in Japan, which meant we had to move three different times. So there's that. Um, so obviously she was a saint. Uh, and, and and my wife puts up with me because, as I said, I am sitting in front of a computer six months out of a year, four, four hours every day. And according to her, she says, and you're out of it even after that, because once you come, once you sub, you know, leave the room, you're still thinking about the about the novel. So I've lost you for another two hours. So she has to be a saint to put up with me as well. So I, I've been very lucky in my life. I have a very, very uh, good family. How did you and Carol meet? Oh, she was taking, my sister was a bodybuilder and a choreographer. And she had a big studio in Miami where she did both the, the, the weightlifting thing and the, uh, and the, she was a, and dancing. And Carol, my wife, was taking a class. Uh, from from Carol from my sister Paulette, and that's where I met Carol in Miami. Carol's a Cuban American. Very neat, D- Dave. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? Wow, <laughs> that's that's a toughie. Um, and as you get older, of course, things you, you change. You know, the most important lesson when you're younger is definitely not the, mo- the most important lesson when you're older. Um, patience, perhaps. Patience and an appreciation for my family. We were just talking about family. Patience and appreciation for my family. Okay. How can people find you and follow you on social media, You know, purchase your books, and, and when will they be able to purchase uh, your new book, Mapping the Night 2? Uh, go on Amazon Books, type in John David Bethel, and you'll find all my books there. Uh, Mapping the Night is available, as you mentioned, I think, uh, end of May, beginning of June again on Amazon. You can also go on Facebook and type in my name. And I have a, beside, in addition to my Facebook page, there are pages for all of my all of my novels as well. So you can get, get me a, a lot of different ways you can find me. Are you on Instagram? You're on Instagram too, correct? Yes, I'm on Instagram. You know, I think it's jd.bethel. I think that's what it is. I, I I can't remember right now, but I'm sure you can find me if you want me, if you want to find me. Right. You know, once again, I, I want to thank our sponsors uh, for Think Big with Michael's owner, Buckley's Grill and Roof and Nail. Uh, Buckley's Grill is owned by Jeff Urinelli and Ken Dick, and Roof and Nail is co-owned by Kelly Potter. Uh Buckley's is located at uh, 5355 Poplar Avenue in Memphis at the corner of the state. And Roof and Nail is located in Olive Branch, but they do work all over the Mid-South. You know, uh, David, I had, I had a lot of fun researching you and your books. Uh, I love your style. It, it's exciting. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. And, you know, obviously it's a lot of fun to read. Um, you just, I, you know, was when I was reading the, the PDF book that you sent me, you just want to read it and and not go away from the computer and not put it down because you've had a, oh, a, a you. full, a full career of so many experiences and, and you're a very interesting man. I can, I can definitely see why you've had success in every area of your life. And, 
uh, you know, despite setbacks, you, you know, work through them because you, you know, were determined, obviously. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on my podcast today. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you. And, 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 I, and I appreciate your having me. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great day. You do as well. Thank you.